takes care of his customers. Last June, he was one of the people that, unfortunately, wasn't on the road for three weeks. And we asked customers to take care of him since we tell Chris, you know, keep it in the backpack. Um, but I'd like to thank everyone, and I'm sorry for speaking so long. I'm not, you guys got me so fast, I was, I was trying to get my thoughts in motion. I wish Gary was here, Mr. Webster. He, he, um, he was my geek. I, I could geek up with him and Mitch. Um, I'd like to thank Mitch and all our fights. Battling for my 30 legs and battling for my area. I travel an hour and a half each day just to eat. And I'd like to thank our commission. And I'd like to see my Red Rocket keep going. Red Rocket for life. Thank you. that there will be an increase to the hours of operation for our customer service call center in Davisville. Uh, currently, the, the times are 9 to 5, and they're going to be extended to 7, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. From th Sorry. Chris, why don't you tell us about this customer service update? <laughs> so the, the Metro Pass Discount Plan Office has a customer service center, the physical one in the basement of Davisville, where you can sign up for the Metro Pass, where you can buy products, where you can make exchanges. Currently operates from 8 to 5 p.m. and extended hours from the first and last day of the month until 5.30. Starting tomorrow on every Thursday and the first and last day of the month, it will be from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. There will be a great deal more opportunity for customers to come in to make exchanges and specifically at least one day a week where they can come to the Metro Pass office after their work hours and they can get that service that they need. So that starts from tomorrow. And uh, the other one is just, I want to make sure, did, did every member of the commission get their vision and mission document that Andy put together? You did get it, it was sent around and someone was put in the same place. So I got another one and I just want to make sure everybody got theirs. Okay, good. And so, um, to as as part of living our vision and our values, what we do, what I like to do at each meeting is provide demonstrations and examples of when our employees actually did live and behave in the vision and the values that we're trying to establish as part of our change. And so, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to read some examples of how our employees were serving not just the riders but our city over the past couple of weeks. So, one of our behaviors that we're trying to Promoters be active and step up and don't wait for others. A blind man with a cane seemed disoriented and started to cross the street, then stopped and turned back to the sidewalk. He then turned back and started toward the crosswalk again. Traffic backed up and people stopped. Everyone seemed willing to be waiting for the blind man to make up his mind. The driver of the Evans 15 bus was not satisfied, just leaving to his own devices there. Instead, he pulled over, came out of his bus, approached the man, spoke to him, and helped him get his bearings so he could walk safely to the sidewalk towards his destination. I was extremely proud to be a Torontonian at this moment. This level of personal care, concern, and service has always made me so proud that we have the TTC and its quality employees and citizens. Another value, that, a core value that we have is valuing the time of our, our customer's time. I have been taking the TTC for over 10 years now, and I've never been so impressed by one of your employees. The driver I encountered today on my journey home has not only put a smile on my face, but has also put a smile on every passenger's face that rode the 36B West bus tonight. He was so funny, pleasant, and respectful. It makes me want to be a better person and a more positive person just by having briefly met him tonight. I really wish I would have asked his name because he deserves to be acknowledged and rewarded for his incredible customer service skills. The next one is about our behavior, about being collaborative and sharing knowledge in order to make better decisions. My 79-year-old mother boarded a Sather Street northbound bus at Glencairn Avenue, traveling to a doctor's appointment to a location she'd never been to before. She asked the driver for assistance and he freely offered it. At some point, the driver had to change with another driver. The outgoing driver briefed the incoming driver about my mother needing some help. At the correct address, the new driver informed my mother that she had arrived at her destination. My mother was very grateful and thanked both of the drivers. I too am very grateful for their assistance and professionalism. Please pass on our gratitude to both of these gentlemen. And finally, it's being accountable and taking responsibility. I have to tell you, I've been and still am in the customer service industry for over 50 years now and I just love it. 
As a diehard commuter, I have found that your bus drivers, station staff, security folks, etc., are the most wonderful and nice folks I've encountered. I constantly observe traits they display as being the best of the best. These folks really need to be shown that they are valued for the extraordinary effort they put out every day. That alone reinforces the customer service mantra I feel the TTC needs to promote at all costs. So can I have a motion to send an acknowledgement of thanks to all the authors who have been mentioned? It is. So before we go to the items that have, where we have deputants and presentations, and any other questions? Thank you, sir, for some 24 miles, 22 of the buses, and 22 of the streetcar routes. The night network just debuted in February of 1987. Well, back in 1987, the Route 77 was not in Swansea, it was a Spadina bus. It was driven by former fighter pilots. The trip ride landing that the ex had to offer at the time. <laughs> and inspired much music to have a video. This is what it looked like pre 1987. This is what it looks like now. Not too much difference up north. Down south, this is what it looked like just after the sky home was built. Things have progressed since then. We have basically added half the population of the capital city of Prince Edward Island to south of the Front Street. They live in high density buildings along the 509 and 510 street court, streetcar corridors. To notice on the map, there's this big honking gap in the middle of the bottom. These are our top 10 busiest routes. I'm warning you, I'll be back in 2015 about the 504 car. But the Spadina car is the number two busiest route in the system. It has no blue night service right now. Queen and Spadina have close to the same number of passengers, but there is a big difference. Per kilometer, Queen moves about 1,800 passengers. Per kilometer, Spadina moves 7,100 passengers per kilometer. Toronto's second busiest service route has no 24 hour service. Three routes end west of, you know, at the exhibition loop. That's 12.5% of all of our Blue Night routes ending there. The only other place that has three routes ending there is Young Lavington. Some of you may be familiar with that area. 20% of all Blue Night uh, vehicles are on the 320 Elm Street with the southern, southern terminus at Queens Key and Bay. With almost 17% of our routes ending at these two termini, up to 28% of all number, uh, blue night vehicles and south of Front Street in these two areas. But the moment that we offer no service to our customers between these two southern ends. By combining our current 509 510 routes, we can service residents along the Spadina Avenue south of, and south of Front Street. The system would, would the down run would be 15 minutes to Queens Key, 7 minutes to Union, 7 minutes from or, Seven minutes from Queen's Key to Union, seven minutes from Union back to Spadina again, seven minutes to the exhibition loop with a two minute layover. The up run would be seven minutes west of Spadina, 15 minutes north of the Spadina station with another two minutes layover. Total run time would be 60 minutes. These timings are based on Sunday morning observations from 5 to 10 a.m. or 5.15 a.m. to 10 a.m. They reflect current track conditions, which, well, we all know about those with 80 to 90 percent of the stops in service during these time periods. The route timings would start at the exhibition loop at the quarter hours, 15 and 45. This would allow better connection with the new streetcar route and the buses that are already servicing there for better safety and convenience for the passengers. Currently, the last southbound streetcar leave is at 2.30 a.m. Monday to Friday, 2.45 on the weekends. The first southbound car starts again at 5 a.m. So there's already lots of service there. We would only need two extra streetcars for two and a half hours each. There's enough capacity at the Roncesville CIS to handle this without extra supervision costs. The wholesale cost of operating TTC vehicles is about $80 an hour. That's label, la labor, fuel, or electricity. At five hours per night, the daily cost is about $400 per day. The next job board starts the 17th of June. That would be $78,000 for the rest of the year. It's not feasible to redo it to start it that quick. 
We are already looking at amending the service on the 29th on the 352 route. So logistically, it makes sense to roll both out at the same time. The cost for the rest of the year would be $62,400. The daily cost to run the queen car is over $101,000. So it's not that much money for the rest of the year. So the station is already set up for streets, streetcar service during hours that the subway is not in service. Union Station will remain closed, and the streetcars would just use that as a loop back. We already do that on the Carlton card, where it doesn't go into the, the station's end service. It empties passengers at Danforth and at Maine. Alan, could you Yep. I, I started, I didn't start your time. Sorry. I didn't start your time. So. Okay, I'm almost done. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think I was that long. Queen Street Terminal will remain open to connect the 320 Young Bus. 310 Blue Knight Bus would service the 511 stop as it does now. The new streetcar route would service the 509 platform at the exhibition route. Once construction on Queen's Key is completed, the legacy streetcars and the legacy streetcars on service the TC, TDC should work with traffic services and the city to optimize the flow of non-rush hour services. There are significant efficiencies to be gained for both car and streetcar traffic flow during these time periods. And that's what it looks like. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Are there any questions? Presenter? Okay. So we'll refer your presentation to Sam. Okay. Thanks, Alan. So with the indulgence of the commission, um have a professional opinion on the um, the proposed methodology for the delivery of the various LRT projects. So that's what this paper does. Um, <laughs> we share a common goal with Metrolinks, Metrolinks and with IO, that is we want to get building. You know, clearly these, uh, cons these projects need to be started, everyone recognises that uh, we've got to actually start the work, so there's absolutely um, nothing between us on that point. Um, having said that, there are a few uh, points that we think the Commission should be aware of and that we should highlight as uh, concerns, uh, and they are like, fleshed out in this paper, so um, I'll let uh, somebody go through the detail. Uh, and then we'll take any questions of questions of what you did during the presentation of the project. As soon as possible, uh, unimpeded with TTC and server issues. The common the goals between TTC and Metrolinx are common. The goals are to have a successful project, proceed with the project as soon as possible, and deliver transit to Toronto as soon as possible. We have excellent relationship with Metrolinx staff. What will fundamentally differ is that the approach by which every agency believes is the best way to deliver this project. Metrolinx board decision in April 25th this year is to proceed with the full project, Eglinton like Crosstown, Scargo RT, uh, RT, the conversion to LRT and extension to Shepherd, Shepherd East LRT, West LRT, and Metrolinx direct the infrastructure to tell you uh, to deliver this project. And this plan is, is supported by TDC, by City Council, by the province, and we can proceed with the full implementation to meet. By way of background, Metrolinx Act uh, 2006 directed that Metrolinx has authority to one of the project projects approve project scope, budget, schedule, and delivery method, oversee uh, operation plan and procurements, and approve the terms of terms and condition of construction contract. So, not, so notwithstanding TTC concern and issue that would be outlined in this presentation, Metrolinx is acting within its mandate to choose and select a project delivery for the project. We have a master agreement between uh, Metrolinx and TTC and to a lesser extent infrastructure Ethereum. The draft master agreement was in place in 2009 and 2010. The master agreement under the file the following. Uh, define the roles and responsibilities of each party or each agency. Formalize the governance structure. Satisfy Metrolinx responsibility for ownership, accounting rules and ownership of the project, and appoint a TTC program <coughs> management manager accountable to both Metrolinx and the Commission for the delivery of the projects. 
basically the rules are MetroLens oversee the project and approve award of contract. So since we have the master agreement, all the contract award uh, went to MetroLens board, not the commission. TTC provide the overall management and delivery of the project. Infrastructure Ontario would act as a procurement agent for selected element of the project. This is the, the government structure, organization chart that the three agencies agreed. You can see that all the delivery function is under the TTC mandate. Metrolinks have uh, their own staff plus uh, consultant providing owner engineer function to oversee the provide oversight of what we do and award the contract. So we have a procurement people from Metrolinx sitting in our offices approving and signing off a contract before we go to the contract award. We have two levels of a governance structure or exact committee. Uh, that resolve any outstanding issue that cannot be resolved within step. This is a project or go the project continue during the planning, EA, and design and construction to the extent that we did construction based on its government structure. So as of today, we managing the project uh, in, all, in all aspects and MetroLens provide oversight and sign off. So as far as the program management that, that we provide, we design the TTC standard and develop construction staging. We go to competitive procurement process for either design and construction. We provide construction management and construction staff to oversee the contract with your construction. And uh, last but not least, we provide community relations, relations and community officers that embedded with the team to act as an advocate to the community with the project team so we can resolve most of the issues, mitigate most of the community issues during the design leading to the construction. They have important function during construction, but really most of the heavy lifting happened during the design to design something that the community would accept and mitigate their, uh, their, their concern. Infrastructure Ontario has delivered many projects to the province largely hospital, courthouse, and prisons. They started to get involved in transit in both Waterloo and Ottawa. None of them have been, uh, have been built so far. Uh, they have what we call AFP delivery. It's, it's, it's acronym for Alternative Finance Procurement. It's a different name for P3 that's common. You know. It's essentially hire a big construction firm to develop the design, complete the design, the design will be progressed with the owner uh, up to preliminary design, then turn over to a private sector to complete the design, uh, manage the construction, develop construction staging, financing, and for many projects including, uh, including uh, included uh, operating and maintenance for 25, 30 years uh, concession contract. Metrolinx, TTC, and Infrastructure Ontario agree to the following principles. All the projects will be delivered under the TTC overall program management, put all the pieces together, ensure the commonality of standards, facts, and all the stuff. TTC design bid build, that's our traditional way of delivering projects. That's what we've been delivering projects for the last 80 years, including Shepherd Subway, including Spine Subway, is design bid build. Design bid build is TTC hire consultants through a competitive bidding process. Design a piece of the project to 100%. We we'll go to the second procurement, uh, competitive procurement to hire contractors to to do the construction, construction and under the overall uh, TTC construction management supervision. So we decided that this is best approach for. Uh, for elements of the project that have high risk and have high likelihood of community disruption. Infrastructure Ontario AFP, uh, we, we agree that, it, uh, that we can implement this approach for elements of the project that have minimum risk and minimum community disruption. That's, that's all agreed to as part of the master agreement 20920. So to represent that graphically, these are the four projects that you are aware of. 
These elements are agreed to be design mid belt of PTC traditional approach, mainly the right of ways. Uh, whether Shepard or Eglinton, the right of way would be design mid belt. We, we saw opportunity to have a design PTC design belt, which is different than IO for, sorry, for Eglinton inline stations. And uh, by combining two or three stations in one big con one contract, we so that we can manage the the risk and the community disruption, uh, and at the same time leverage some of the big construction company to have attractive package to deliver. The other components are what we agreed at that time to be I/O delivery type of thing as a procurement agent. Again, within the TTC overall project management, we have integrated team in our offices of TTC, international uh, 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 consultant companies, Metrolinx, and IO sitting in the same office delivering the projects. So the element that we agreed and proceeded, uh, proceeded on as IO type of uh, contract are the yards, the metal and storage yards, and the SRT. The common factor between the two is they have minimum community impact. The APL SRT has almost a, a very minimal community impact. They are a loose parcel of land. The contractors can work in isolation. And these elements, uh, scheduled saving and scheduled compression, can come from increased workforce. So, so the more people they throw at the project or this element, the faster they can finish the project. In the right of way, we're hesitant to do that because we have to, to address community issues. And the SRT, there is a technical issue with the SRT that we felt that if you if we procure it as a design build, it's going to encourage a uh, contractor to come with some innovation as far as how we do it. We, uh, the SRT, we have to raise the roof because the LRT is... So it encourages consult, uh, 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 consortium contractor and consultant to come up with a way how to raise the roof. We don't really care how they raise the roof as long as they meet the, the specs and, and, uh, and the standard. For example, the shepherd yard, the shepherd yard we went as far as <coughs> issuing the RFP with IO to build the shepherd mental storage facility. It was about four weeks away from closing when the whole plan was changed to all underground and uh, we worked with I.O. and Metrolinx to put it. We were satisfied with, uh, with the way the contract was uh, going to be led. You can see here that we say maintenance. What we mean maintenance here for the yard, for example, is maintenance of the building. Not the vehicle of the yard, not the operating system, the actual building. And it gives some advantage to Metrolinx to have the building in the state to good repair for 25 years, 30 years. Uh, concession period, and we agree to that. We still maintaining the vehicle and the operating system and the vital uh, system that required to deliver service. However, in April of 2011, Metro X advised us of two changes. Number one, in Metro X role will be changed from oversight function to actual implementation of the project, and Metro and. Uh, Metrolinx project would be uh, uh, delivered entirely by uh, infrastructure battery. TTC will still, will still operate the completed line, but the delivery and the governance will completely change. The stated advantage of the AFP, the way we understand it from, the, from Metrolinx and IO, is the fair cost later to later in the project. So when we do a project, we uh, pay the contractor monthly on the progress made. They don't do that. They pay, they they finance the project for a number of years, between 10 to 30 years, depending on how they do the project. Transfer risk from public sector to private sector. Budget and schedule predictability. Encourage innovation, cost saving, and faster completion. We have expressed to Metrolinx our concern with this approach. And we've been talking to Metrolinx about our concern and issue, issues for the last 12 months or more. 
However, in order to provide some clarity on the issue, TTC invited AFTA, American Public Transit Association, to assemble a team of high-level executives, transit executives from North America, to assist us, us means TTC and, and Metrolinx, on what's the best way to deliver projects. And the, the report has more information about the credential of these people, but between the four of them, they deliver over $60 billion worth of project, and they're very highly regarded uh, in the industry and considered as leader and authority in project delivery. Metrolinx delivery is for the Eglinton Crosstown. The tunnel will continue as is, as designed with built and the rest of the line will be packaged in one line, in one contract. And uh, they expect and hope to have a contract by 2014, and they're maintaining that the project will be completed by 2020. Shepherd East, same type of thing, 2014-2018 opening, 2014 awarded contract, 2018 opening. SRT is 2014 award, opening 2019. Finch LRT, Finch West uh, uh, LRT 2015-2019. And the Shepherd, uh, the, the Shepherd Mentors, all the Mentors storage facility continue with I.O. as we have agreed to that previously anyway. This is the schedule that provided by Metrolinx to its board, uh, outlining uh, the issue of RFP and the construction. And you can notice here that all the RFPs almost going to be in the market at the same time, all the construction is going to happen at the same time. So, the after peer review have agreed with TTC concern, and I'm going to outline uh, TTC and after conclusion and concern. The first is Metro schedule is unrealistic, and they outline, and we outline a few concerns. Number one is, is it required the design to be suspended? There are not the, uh, 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 some stations that we reach, reach or reach in 30% design now. We have to stop the design with it the procurement. Require all the stations to be, or all the projects really, to be designed and constructed at the same time. And as far as Eglinton specifically, uh, the, their comment about, or our comment about the schedule unrealistic, Mid-Rent schedule required the entire project to be built in four years. So by award of contract in 2014, and please remember that the contract is awarded with less than 100% design. That's a whole type of design job. So if that contract is awarded by 2014, and it, it's going to be a challenge to get all this contract awarded by 2014, 2015 for all the projects. That's uh, with consultant and project management resources available in North America either. So anyway, assuming that the, issue, that the contract will be awarded in 2014, that the consortium is going to take about a year to design something, six months to a year to design something to start construction, they don't have to design the whole project, they have to design a piece of it like we do. But it's going to take some time, it's going to involve application and obtaining some permits of some sort, whether from the city throne to move utilities or building permit or what have you. So let's assume that, uh, to be optimistic, that the construction is actually going to start by 2015. The stated completion date is 2020. The project will going to need at least a year of testing and commission, so back off a year from 2019. You start 2015, you have to finish by 2019 to test and commissioning. So really the entire project is going to be done in four years. Uh, we don't think this is, this is realistic uh, or achievable. The other issue concurrent with that, because the project, the schedule is very aggressive, is you push more construction in the right of way. Again, our concern, not the yard, not the bit, is the right of way and going through the communities. You push more construction uh, to the community in four years that you have 10 underground stations and, and, and actually 20 kilometers right away, but at the same time, it means more community impact with this construction. And because the contract is so huge, it's going to be very difficult, and get to it later, to, after the award of contract, to actually address the community concerns. 
Shepard Finch and uh, uh, SRT, we have no issue with the schedule. However, we note that Shepard, under TTC proposal, or the proposal that was agreed on, we can restart construction of Shepard 2013 and instead of Metro S2014. The completion date is going to be the same, but uh, it's just the fair of construction of Shepard by a year. Finch and the SRT, no issue really as far as the schedule. It seems okay. Recommendation, develop a realistic schedule, phase construction, meaning less impact on the community, allow enough time for test and commissioning. For Metrolinks, we don't understand how, exactly how much they allow for test and commissioning. So in our schedule, we allow a year, but we allow a year because in our schedule, we, we are able to, to do some testing as we go along, as pieces are being completed. With Metrolinks schedule, that a year would not be enough because everything is going to come online at the same time. Continue with the design. There's no point uh, suspending design now when, uh, uh, for two years. Continue with the design and start Shepard as soon as possible. Next, uh, concerns private financing. The TTC were not expert in financing. The APTA peer review that we retain, they're not expert financing either. The province is. So please take this note to what it meant. We know the following. We know that private financing is more costly than public financing. To finance something for 10 years, uh, probably is going to carry about 50% or more premium to pay over private sector. What we understand is private sector will have to pay 4 or 5 percentage point more than public sector. Over 10 years, about 40%. Then you add the compounding effect. So at least 50% premium for financing. We wouldn't understand this. Two, whether there is ability in the market to have contractor financing the multi-billion dollar projects or not. And thirdly, is, is a big flag that we put measurements and I.O. to be caution with this thing. In the last 15 years, we only found one project that completed with private finance. I'll talk about transit project. That's the kind of the line. The kind of the line that private financing was about 30%, and essentially it's covered funding gap, but it wasn't meant to deliver value for money. The Eagle Line in, in Denver, the same thing, they have about 25%, 30% private financing because they had they had, they have to proceed with the project to with the project to go to the next referendum to get sales tax to pay for their project. So again, same type of thing. It's to cover funding gap, not to provide value for money. Uh, we understand that Ottawa are doing something similar. We don't distill it at the early stages. So when you have something that uh, have very limited application, no application at all in North America, you have to be extra careful adopting this, especially when you have multi-billion dollar type of projects. Competition. I think everybody can agree that the larger the projects, the less competition you can get. So not, not only that you have a, 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 a contract, multi-billion dollar contract, now you tag in the ability to finance, and it could be very hard to get uh, a, competitive bidding, uh, a competitive bidding of three or four bidders. We expect that we're going to get one or maybe nothing. Uh, internally, in the last four months, we advised Metrolinx and IO that we prefer to limit the size of the contract to about half a billion dollar contract. And we felt comfortable with that would attract three, four bidders per package. Uh, the peer review came and, uh, and presented exactly the same number, $500 million to attract competitivity. Multi-billion dollar project, it carries the risk of having one bid or no bids especially when you tag in the financing piece of yeah. <clears throat> Community impact, which I started explaining. All the design happened at the same time, all the construction happened at the same time. And uh, the problem for the community is, A, you're pushing more construction in the community in very aggressive schedule. B, the contract is actually awarded before the design is completed. So we know from our experience that communities 
don't really express their concern at the 10% conceptual design stage. They express their concern when we get down to finishing the design and go through the detailed construction stage. And that's when they actually start this. So the community impact has to be dealt with after the award of contract. And after all of the contracts, they'll be difficult because they have a contract awarded for a fixed amount of price. And uh, Metrox might choose to have some cash allowance bills and bills in the contract. But the fact is, they have a very aggressive schedule to begin with. They have to do all the construction, the, 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 the station construction concurrently. So the schedule impact is going to be very tight uh, and, and probably very difficult to accommodate. The second is the cost of the change itself. The community concern might be minor in nature, but the time impact, because you have the financing piece to it, you have to carry a financing charge for three weeks, for a month, for two months until the issue is resolved. The financing piece we expect to be much more expensive than the, actually, the actual issue that the community wanted to address. Project delivery, APTA and TTC uh, both agree that one size doesn't fit all, and we have to look at different project elements and select the, the, the best project delivery for each of these pieces. So this is the APTA TTC approach, probably not TTC approach, it's what the approach that we agreed all that we're going to adapt in 2, 9, two, 10. This is the after review. So tunneling, design bit build, after design bit build, Mitterrands agree with that, that's not an issue. Eggman station, inline station, package two, three, two or three station in a package. After agree, that's the, the, the appropriate approach. Uh, interchange station, like Eggman West, Eggman Young, and Candy, have, have to or must, have, must be design bit build to manage it's a, it's, it's a complex station, it's a live station, we have to manage the passenger and protect our station. Scarborough RT, design build, maintain with IO, we agree to that. Peer review said design bit build, they, they don't say, uh, they don't put the F part of it because they, they don't understand the financing piece, so it's simple. Shepard, we said design bit build to protect the right of way of communities. Have to differ a little bit with TTC and, and Shepard and Finch. They said you can deliver it either way. There is no preference. You can do a design bit build or you can do a design build. Have to said both project delivery can work. Young Design uh, TTC agreed that it's IO type of contract. Again, the have to said design build maintain, which is the same thing. We just didn't, didn't agree to the financing part. System design build, that's how system is being. Is, is delivered anyway, so there's no issue after the point the same thing, the same thing. So in conclusion, Metro Lens schedule on the listing would recommend, recommend that Metro Lens have a closer look at the schedule and go down in detail and develop a construction schedule with a shaded construction footprint that would be, uh, would be required to do this. Private financing, as I said, we don't understand it, but we'd like the province to have a second look at, at the merit of this. Limited competition, if, if limited competition is going to increase, co increase cost. Limited competition is going to come from two things, size of contract, multi-billion dollar contract, and to the financing piece. Wholesale risk transfer, risk transfer uh, 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 from public sector to private sector could not be done in wholesale approach you transfer risk to the contract, risk to the contract that can control, mitigate, and profit from the risk. So by having better productivity, he makes more money. Good, he transfers the stress. But the risk that the contractor cannot control and cannot profit from it, you better off keep it because the contractor is gonna price it way too high and any change is gonna require a significant change order, i.e. community impact i.e. geotechnical uh, and soil information. They can control it, they're not going to spend, we, we, can, we, we get in geotechnical information for evidence for the last two years and we haven't finished. 
Contractors are not going to spend two years before tender to get the genetic information. So we keep this risk to the owner. So the whole point of the risk transfer, you transfer risk to the party that is best able to control, mitigate, and profit from it. And if you can do that, as an owner, you keep the risk. Community impact, it's, it's with this big contract, uh, community impact is going to come and it's going to result in cost or scheduled impact if they are uh, incomplete. Project delivery, we encourage Metro Lens to look at the project element, not the whole thing, and, this, and decide with, uh, with the TTC and with the help of other transit experts what's the best way to deliver various, various project elements. Now, what's the TTC role if the province uh, pushed ahead with the AFP? Well, we're the operating of the TTC system. So any underground uh, station, it has to be a connection to the station, and we have four interchange stations. We have Eglinton West, Eglinton Young, Kennedy, and Don Mills. Have to be designed to TTC standard, have to be signed to design and construction station, have to be signed off by TTC because it's an existing facility, and we encourage MetroLens to look again at the schedule to allow time for at least for TTC to respond and review the design property and provide provide company TTC would be required to sign safe, the system safety certification, which means the system is safe to be operated. This is a certificate that's not not signed by the owner; it's signed by the operator. So TTC have to sign it, and therefore we have to review all the operating system and and continue to be involved throughout the project for the operating system. Again, same comment with the schedule. As TTC program management, this function will no longer be required. It's going to be transferred to MetroLinks. TTC staff from the Transit Expansion Department will be uh, uh, transitioned and to other area of the organization with the construction department, and uh, mainly the construction department that delivered the state of good repair project and Spadina uh, extension project uh, in order to retain expertise, succession planning, we uh, construction department, Spadina and engineering department that report me, we rely a lot on in-house consultant. Now we can get the TTC staff to replace some of the consultant. The community engagement that we started for the Eglinton and the Light Trail project, we want to continue doing it, apply the same principle to the rest of the organization. So in conclusion, TTC and TTC and AFTA have concern about the metro schedule. We believe it's unrealistic. If TTC pressed ahead, uh, sorry, it's the province pressed ahead with the AFP project delivery, TTC would no longer project manage the project. However, we're going to stay involved just by virtue of the fact that we are operating with the existing uh, uh, system and we'll be operating with the new system and we'll always be available for mental links for discrete or uh, from time to time to provide any technical advice they, they feel they might need from time to time. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Simon. So there's some deputies, but I also know that uh, the CEO wants to make a few comments. Thank you, Chair. Right. Um, I just want to make a few comments. Just and thank you, Simon. That's a very uh, comprehensive summary. That is a lot for people to take in, and I just wanted to make some key points um, as the CEO. Look, first up, this is not about the TTC being resistant or being awkward about this, okay? And that's why I made the point at the start that um, at the end of the day, that paper was remitted to us. We were asked to come back to report back, and that's what we've just now done. Um, I made the point earlier that we've got a common objective, which is to get this thing built, or to get all these systems built, and there's nothing between us on Metro, between us and Metrolinx, stroke IO on that. We want to get on with it, and we want to get some shovels in the ground. Uh, second key point is that we explicitly acknowledge that it's the province's prerogative to both fund and um, implement the model that they see fit. Ultimately, it's their cash, so they should uh, be ultimately be able to determine how they see fit. But what we're doing here is flagging some concerns that we, we feel need to be addressed. You pay us to exercise due diligence, so that's what we've done. 
Uh, but we're not arrogant enough to think that we've always, we always have the right answers, which is why we brought in international experts, okay? And these were independent people, they weren't consultants, we didn't pay them. Uh, they're people who know what they're doing, what they're doing and if, if, as, um, as those bios showed, uh, have delivered a lot of projects. So these are people whose, whose um, uh, opinions we should be mindful of. So it's not about us being um, resistant to new ideas. In fact, we've already said that we think AFP is a good fit for some of the elements of the scheme. Um, so we, you know, we are open to that. Um, whatever your decision and whatever your direction obviously will live with it, we want to get on with it. Uh, the one thing we guarantee is that we will continue, as we have up until now, to work very constructively with Metrolinx and IO because ultimately we share that common objective. So I just thought they were real key points to issue. Thank you very much. So there may be questions if you say. This is where we're standing right now for our projects. How we got here, we're not going to speak to that, it's time to move on. In June 2010, Metrolinx committed to 182 LRG vehicles at a cost of $700 million. The initial delivery schedule of these cars was to start in 2013 and run until 2020. Now, in order to minimize contract penalties, much less will be moving forward with the construction of the Shepherd LRG maintenance and storage facility in 2013 and will be completed by 2016. Unfortunately, these vehicles could be waiting for as much as three years before going into revenue service on the Shepherd LRG line. The DPC and Metro Lakes currently have four active contracts for rail vehicles. Those are the numbers of the overall of the units ordered. Mogarge's Thunder Bay plant will soon have four production lines working to complete these contracts. With over $2 billion in contracts, Mogarge is a highly motivated vendor and will want to keep both agencies happy. <coughs> Metrolinx has already committed to work with the TTC to identify opportunities for early works, providing the show value for money is demonstrated. Both the legacy streetcars and the Transit City LRT cars are both from the same chassis. Bombardier Flex of the Outlook, the one at the bottom. The TTC Legacy cars in the southern sections are slightly customized. The LRT cars are more of an off the shelf segment. In order to minimize contract penalties, the city will have to pay and maximize the number of available service vehicles to Toronto and sooner. This is what I'm suggesting. The first two years of the Metrolinx contract we used to produce Legacy streetcars. For financing reasons, the Metrolinx will temporarily, temporarily retain ownership of these vehicles. The last two years of the TPC contract would be used to produce Transit City LRT cars. Again, for financing reasons, the TTC would temporarily retain ownership of those vehicles. The end of both contracts, we would simply do a rolling stock swap in order to balance inventory with both agencies. By, some, by the summer of 2015, we get about to 50 more legacy streetcars as part of our active fleet. This would almost double the available fleet compared to what the TTC contract alone would do by 2015. It would help speed up the introduction of the Presto car to TTC users. Just a reminder, summer 2015, we have that going on. Extra vehicles will be needed to, to operate, the, you know, get around the city during these games. Unfortunately, transit plan we have right now Looks a little like this. So I'm just asking for you to remove the period of this. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. I'm Jessica Bell. I'm with the TTC Riders. The TTC Riders represents the interests of public transit riders in this city. TTC Riders, I've got two points to make on this. One is that the TTC Riders wants a publicly accountable TTC to act as a project manager and community liaison for the LRT projects. Why? We want our LRT projects to be built in an open and transparent way that will allow Torontonians to give community input. We want our concerns to be considered and responded to. We think the TTC is best equipped to do that job. The TTC has spent the last three plus years in community consultations and project planning, primarily through its Office of Transit expansion. TTC has learned from its experiences with past large transit projects, such as the uh, St. Clair right-of-way, that community relations and consultations are crucial to the ultimate success of the project. We are concerned by the one-size-fits-all approach that Infrastructure Ontario's AFP process would appear to apply to the LRT projects. 
We are concerned about allowing unknown private contractors to exclusively manage the expansion of light rail in our city. We fear that AFB contracting could lead to major changes without the same opportunity for public input. Important considerations like station location and designs would typically subject, be subject to public consultation. But this could change with the AFB contracting process. Torontonians need to have a say in how these projects roll out. We believe we will have more of an input in this rollout if the TTC acts as a project manager and community liaison and not an unknown private operator. That's my first point. The second point is that we're worried about delays. It appears that this new infrastructure Ontario AFP process is responsible for the plan to delay the completion of the Shepherd East LRT project. We don't want delays, we want good transit ASAP. TTC Riders supports the TTC and APTA peer review recommendation to start construction of the Shepherd East LRT immediately. To conclude, we encourage the province, the TTC and Metrolinx to not take a one-size-fits-all approach to the LRT plans and to do everything they can to deliver new public transit quickly, ensure community input and minimise traffic, transit and community disruptions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, are there any questions? Thank you very much. Um, I'd hate to see you receiving a birthday present if that's how uh, optimistic you are now. Um, you mentioned that there is, um, in one of the points, that there is limited application for trans AFP for transit projects in North America. But is it not correct that there have been dozens of transportation projects using an AFP or B3 model in North America? Uh, yes, my comment to the solicitor's uh, trans. Yeah. And how about worldwide in terms of transit? Have there been AMP procured uh, transit projects in Europe or in South America or other parts of the world? Uh, AFP was the preferred delivery approach for transit projects in parts of Europe, mm -hmm. such as Greece, Ireland, Spain. Stop now. And. Uh, that's why we have all the Spanish company coming to North America because they're not building it at this point. Thank you. Um, in terms of your, your worry about competition being uh, inhibited by the bid size being too large, I mean, we recently gone through um, on transportation projects in, in Ontario, the Windsor Essex Parkway, which I'm assuming that bid was much larger than 500 million. And uh, 407 East, I think, is probably in that range or larger. Was there a, a, a limited number of bids on those? Uh, I think they got about three project, three uh, proposal for uh, the Winds of Essex. Yeah. Uh, again, it's transportation project, but different than um, transit. And you mentioned the kind of uh, you know the panel team, and I don't question their expertise. I'm sure they know their stuff. But I noticed they're um, certainly from jurisdictions that haven't done AFP, and as you mentioned, there haven't been a lot of AFP transit projects in the states. So of your panel, how much AFP experience and projects do you think they have? None. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, in Vancouver, Canada Line, how was that procured? Uh, the Canada Line included 30% private financing to cover a budget gap, essentially. Uh, so was it an AFP or a hybrid AFP? It's operated by a, by a private operator. Yes, yeah, it's operated by a private operator. You, 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 there are differences, but for argument's sake, you can say it's, it's an AFP type. type and, and that's working well? It will have a sense of well. And yeah. deliver, delivered on schedule? Yes, that's actually the, the, the major accomplishment of the Canada line, that it, it, it was delivered three months ahead of the schedule. That's not a small thing to achieve. And it's a comparable technology to what you're looking at uh, no, building here? No, no. It's, it's comparable to the SRT. It's, uh, it's ICTS technology, not RT. And that's what the impact of this is the station itself are completely different. The stations in, in the kind of line are about 56 meters. Our station box with the SRT is about 130 meters, which means that your construction footprint is longer, or you tell it to the obviously. Um, and just a question. Um, 
not directly related to the construction issues, but uh, we've, or staff have been moving forward with Metrolinx on the assumption that the TTC will be the, the operator of these new lines. Uh, has any thought been given by either side uh, that Metrolinx, in fact, would be the operator, not necessarily the TTC? Yes, but uh, it was decided by the province and the minister that the TTC would operate the line. Um, at this point, do you have any assumptions as to whether these lines uh, would, on an operating basis, pay for themselves, or would they require subsidy? Uh, we haven't done the analysis, but I can almost certain that it's going to require subsidies. It's for Metrolinx to consider starting construction on Shepherd Avenue in 2013, and I think their schedule is, is, is later than that. What makes you think? Um, that we could facilitate, or to the royal we, all governments combined, with Metrolinx and us and everybody else, what gives you hope or what makes you think that we could actually see shovels in the ground on Shepherd in six or eight months from now? Okay. Uh, it's not six or eight months, I said 2013. Six or eight months from now. Okay. And uh, from now then, and yeah. say next summer, what makes yeah. you optimistic? Yeah. Because, that's, because based on the status of the project, with the project was the halted. So when we proceeded with Shepherd LRT originally, we have a package, we develop a project implementation plan that have packages about four or five kilometers at the time. The first package, the, the design was almost complete. So we have to complete the design. We have to put a project team together because the project team has been uh, uh, assigned to other duties, but we have a design for the first four kilometers that almost 75% completed. So that's what I'm, how I base my assumption. So is your submission to us as a commission, is, is that one option for Metrolinx to consider is, if you will, giving the job to the TTC to implement versus going through a competitive bid process around the world? Our recommendation on concern that presented in, in, in this report, Metrolinx is fully aware of it. We've been discussing it for 12 months. Uh, but their desire to have FP, the FP procurement takes time. That, that's all. Okay, and in terms of, of this, the, the, the overall projects are, are $8.5 billion. Um, we have uh, the provincial government fronting all of that money. So it's their dime. And are you comfortable? You've given some concerns saying we think their construction schedule is, I think you were using the word aggressive and ambitious. But isn't it good to be aggressive and ambitious and want to get transit to as many people as quickly as possible? Shouldn't we be tipping our hats to uh, Metrolinx for, for wanting to build us the targeted changes that flowed from the RGS? And then the 2012 TTC budget proposed back in September 2011 actually rolled back standards to pre-ridership growth strategy levels. Attempts to undo this were blocked by your predecessor commission. Deep bus loading standards increased by 10%, resulting in service cuts and increased crowding. Off-peak loading standards increased by 20% for routes with scheduled service every 10 minutes or less. From the budget, we know this yielded a net savings of about $14 million. As someone who worked hard to see RGS implemented so many years ago, it's gratifying that its principles are still valued. The heart of RGS was to confront a culture of, we can't afford it, that meant any proposal to change services or fare structures. Too often, policy options were foreclosed in private before they ever reached the commission or council, and basic information necessary to choose between alternatives was not available. Council voted an extra $5 million for service this year, an amount roughly equal on an annualized basis to the $2.1 million you see for this fall. That $5 million was diverted into Wheeltrans to plug a gap in its funding. Although this was a laudable move, it was not Council's intention, nor did it permanently address shortfalls in Wheeltrans budget. The Commission should thoroughly review Wheeltrans service and funding requirements because across the board cuts, such as the original goals for the 2012 budget, hit Wheeltrans much harder than the regular TTC system. Wheeltrans